Oh, no, I have one minute. <laughs> and it's a light Sunday. I want to give everyone a chance to get here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, also known as the Copper Top. I'm Pastor Janine Alexander, and I am so glad that you are here this Sunday after Palm Sunday after Easter. And now you are here when we start a new sermon series. And I want us to begin our worship by claiming who we are. So would you read with me our mission statement? We welcome all people, are guided by the teachings and unconditional love of Jesus, and are inspired to participate as faithful disciples of Christ. She's fine right there. She knows a children's message is going to be happening, and it's going to be great. You're just doing great. And I hear you're having a birthday this week. And you're going to hear, turn two. Uh-oh. Oh, but she's strong, strong. Again, I'm Pastor Janine Alexander, and we welcome you to worship. Welcome to those of you worshiping here in this place right at this time. Welcome those of you who are worshiping online at this very moment. Mary Jane is your online host. Let her know of birthdays, anniversaries, or prayers, because you are fully a part of this church family. And if you're online, make sure to get something for communion elements, bread and juice, so that you can participate with us. And welcome to those of you who are worshiping at some time later on in the week. Together we are all a part of the faith family, and we are so glad that you are here. Children, there'll be a, t a children's message, and you're going to stay through communion, and then there'll be nursery time and Sunday school time. It's going to be great. For kids, right outside the sanctuary doors to your left are activity bags that they are welcome to have every single week. A special welcome to those of you who are visiting for the first time in person or online. We're glad you're here. Already we've been praying for you that as you are in this time of worship, whatever your heart is needing and yearning for, you will find. And if you're looking for a church home, we would love to be your church family. And if you are needing a pastor, I am here for you. Let me know if you're here in person. Let Mary Jane know if you're online. Also, in person, we have a welcome table. Right outside the sanctuary doors to your left is the welcome table. And you can go there, get a welcome gift if you're the first-time person, find information about the church, sign up for a class to learn more about our church, and people will greet you there. And today, Today we have our new welcome and office connection staff person hired. It is Greg LaVisca. Where is Greg? He's probably at the welcome table. Come on out, Greg. This is Greg, so if you are new, make sure to see Greg. Greg will be looking around for you. Greg is kind of new himself, so if he comes up to you and you've been here for 50 years and he says, welcome, are you here for the first time? Don't bite his head off. Just say, just say I've been here a few times. It'll be... It'll be nice. And then Mary Giese, who has been holding that role, we are going to have a time of celebration for her after worship the first Sunday in May, and I know you'll want to be here for that. We have a Connect card, whether you're in person or online. Those in person, receive those when you walked into church. Those online, you can get the Connect card below the worship video and in the weekly email. Register your attendance. It's important for us to know because I don't know where people and when people are worshiping, and it really is helpful. And then you can sign up to participate in two things. You can sign up to participate in our LED conversion process, which you'll learn about at the offering time. And you can sign up because you have a child or grandchild or friend or niece or nephew interested in summer day camp or the mission trip, and we'll get you information about that. Wednesday, remember we have activities for all ages, dinner from 6 to 6.30. Dinner is going to be really good. We're going to have sub sandwiches. We're going to have macaroni and cheese. We're going to have salad. We're going to have veggies. We're going to have fruit. It's going to be great, so plan on coming to that. And then Sundays before worship, we have a faith forum. Next Sunday at 9 o'clock, the Duluth Public Library Manager will talk about challenges public libraries are facing. You are welcome to come to that. In this church, we like to celebrate special events in your lives. Who here is having a birthday this week? Oh, Viola is having a birthday. You're going to be two, and this means you have to stop by Pastor Janine's office after church for your prize. Good. Two and four. Happy birthday, Laura. You're too old for my prize box, but you're still loved and celebrated. Any others? Do you have any online? Because I have a few more. 
I have okay. one. You have one, yes? I believe someone um, standing in the, in the front is having a birthday this week. That, I believe it's Pastor Janine's birthday this week. It Friday. Is, it is true. So. And it's Friday, which is my day off. Wow. Perfect. But Happy what day. a better way to spend a birthday than with church people. Right. And Charlie is Charlie having a birthday Bruce. this yeah. week. And Jennifer Morgan Redepenning and Tess Cantonen. And that's what I have down. Any anniversaries this week? Would you stand up if you're celebrating? An, I saw you and Jacob online. It's today. Seven years, but way more years together. Thirteen together. How awesome is that? Any other anniversaries? Any online? Okay. Then let us stand together as Mark leads us in the call to worship. We start our journey of courage because of Easter, doubts and fears no longer blind us. We start our journey of courage. Light of Jesus, Jesus. hope is we have. We start our journey of courage. Do we see? Please remain standing as we sing. At the front, we start our journey. It's in the Faith We Sing book, or it's projected at the front of the church. Please be seated, except kids. Any kids, come on up front and join me. And if parents want to come with them because that's more comfortable for the kids, you're welcome to do that. Come on up. I see some of you. There you are. Happy birthday. Good morning. And you're for... Gabe, it's this way. Hey, there you go. Everyone sit and get comfortable. You sit. Are you here all by yourself today? No brother? No? Okay. There you go. Welcome, welcome. I knew you'd be coming. I knew that would happen. Excellent. 
So glad you're here. I love seeing you on Sundays, and I love seeing you on Wednesdays. Your brother is downstairs. Some people are still in the nursery. Some are up here. It's, we, do a variety of, we do a variety of things. Today I'm going to talk about this, and I know some of you can't read. Can any of you read what that says? Let's ask them. Can any of you read what that says? You got it. It says courage. We're going to talk about courage. Who knows what courage is? It's a tough word. It can take courage to be nice to someone, especially if they're not necessarily nice to you. Being brave. That Matthew, you're brilliant. Guess what? I, my sermon is called Brave Faith because courage is about being brave. Sometimes it takes courage to do things like come up for children's message. That takes courage. We're going to look at some slides about things that take courage, and then you tell me what it takes courage to do. So let's look at the first slide. What does it take courage to do? He's helping him. Riding a bike. Yes. Have you ever fallen when you've ridden a bike? Your brother has, but not you. Okay. Then it takes courage when you've fallen to get back up. Let's see. What does it take courage to do here? Have you ever climbed things that high on a playground? That is scary. Let's look at the next slide. What's it take courage to do? And I think if you ever climb a tree, I don't want you going upside down. That's too much courage, and there's a different word for that. What's the next picture of? Kids going where? School. School. It takes courage to go to school. Not really that much? I bet... Have you ever, Dahlia, not been prepared for a test at school? That takes courage. Okay, let's see here. That takes courage to go? Swimming. Swimming. And one more takes courage to go? To the doctor. To the doctor. Have you ever been afraid to go to the doctor? I have. You have? Even though you're, yeah. No? So. Well, the Bible tells us things about courage. So I want you to look at this. And this is our scripture for today about courage. Can you show us a slide about courage? Oh, I don't want that picture. I, I need a, isn't there a scripture? No, okay, so I'm going to tell you the scripture that would have been up there. It's be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord is always with you. Listen to that again. Say it after me. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified. For the Lord your God goes with you. And you know what can happen when the Lord your God goes with you? The next picture. What's happening in this picture? A lion. But what's outside of the mirror? Is it a lion? A cat. So a little kitten looks in a mirror. And what does a little kitten see a little kitten? No, he sees he's brave and strong, and he sees how brave and strong God created him to be. Jesus gives us courage to see how strong and brave we are inside with God helping us. In church today, and for six weeks, we're going to be learning all about courage. So as we begin, I want us to pray together. Can everyone, kids and adults alike, close your eyes and fold your hands and pray after me. Thank you, God for giving us courage. Help us talk to you when we are afraid and need courage. Use us to help others and be brave too. Amen. Now we're going to do something a little different today. You're going to stay in here just a little bit longer for communion, and that is next. And you'll come up and have communion. And then Larry and Dahlia will be in the back, and they'll be waiting for the kids. Some of the kids will go to Sunday school, elementary kids. Some of the kids will go to nursery. And some kids will choose to stay and worship. But as soon as communion is done, and we're going to let the kids, as soon as communion starts, kids come up and do it. And if you're parents with the kids, do it first. And then Dahlia and Larry will be in the back to take them where they need to go. So you can go sit with Larry if you want right now. You can sit with Dahlia in the first row. You can sit with your parents. First row would be a good place to be. And then soon you'll get to go downstairs. And I bet in Sunday school they're going to learn about courage today. Is that right, Larry? Does it take courage to be my boyfriend? 
Yeah. <laughs> and now we come to our table of Holy Communion, and we invite those of you online to make sure you have elements, something to drink and something to eat, so that you can participate. Those in person, we have elements for you, and if you want to stay in your seat, you can be served in your seat, and there's also individual elements that the ushers have, if you prefer it that way. Friends, we come to the Lord's table. We confess our sins that can get in the way of right relationship with you, O God with you, with others, and with ourselves. We trust that God abundantly forgives. By the Spirit, God has claimed us and called us by name into God's family. And we do our best to follow the ways of kindness, courage, and compassion, and all the things that make for peace and hope and build up community. It is a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, O God, from the rising of the sun to its setting, your name be praised. We join our spirits now with your people on earth and with all who have gone before us who forever sing the glory of God's name. And so today, we remember on the night of his betrayal, Jesus took a simple ordinary loaf of bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his friends and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He did the same with the cup after supper, the ordinary drink at the table, saying, This cup that is poured out is my love given to you. Drink of it and let my love flow through you. We ask you, O oh God, to pour out your spirit upon us and on these gifts of the bread and the cup. Make them be for us Christ's love and healing in the world. Amen. You are invited to the communion table, whether you are at home or whether you are here in person. When you come to the table, you will receive the broken bread, and we invite you to bring your every brokenness, your every pain, every area in your life where you need strength and courage and healing, and find that in Jesus, the bread of life. And you will be offered the outpoured cup and invited to pour forth your sins, your failures, your shortcomings, your fears, your bondage, and allow God to pour forth healing and life and wholeness on you. Did you know that our communion table is an open table? You don't need to be a member of this church or a United Methodist Church. You don't need to be a member of any church to come to the table. You just need to be seeking God's love for you and wanting to follow the ways of Jesus Christ. At the appropriate time, the ushers will direct you forward by the center of aisles. There will be a piece of bread that will be given to you. Gluten-free bread is in the center if you need that. And then there will be a cup for you to take. On the sides are places for you to put the cups that are disposable cups, recyclable, when you are done. And again, if you want to be served in a pew, let an usher know. If you want individual elements, they have those for you. And once we have served the servers, we will begin and let our children come for Holy Communion first. Will those who are serving please come to the table? Jean, this is the bread of life given for you.
Once you have taken Holy Communion, you're welcome to come to the kneelers and pray. And if you're there, I'll pray a blessing upon you. Children and families, come forward.
God, you have set us free to go in peace as you have promised. No words can fully express our gratitude for your love, grace, kindness, and mercy for us and all the world. May the bread and juice remain with us as we seek to take your message of hope and healing and courage to all we meet. Blessing and honor are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together, I come with joy. It's number 617. Let us rise as we sing. Please be seated. We missed one birthday earlier in the service, and we also want to wish Pat Miller a very happy birthday. Pat shows up with gratitude for life and friends and family. So Pat, we wish you a very happy birthday. And we come now to a time of prayer, an opportunity for us to be before God with all that we are, all that we have, all that we think and feel and do, all that we are worried about, all that keeps us up at night, God wants to help us hold it all. And so you are always welcome to share your prayer requests with this community by reaching out to someone on the staff or calling the church office. We want to be in prayer with and for you. We'll begin this morning with the prayers that have been shared in this community, and we will close our prayer time with the version of the Jesus Prayer that's printed in your bulletin and will also be projected. And so I would invite you now to come before God, to bring your whole self before God as we join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray together. Holy God, you have called us to follow in the way of the risen Christ, to care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but also with acts of love. As we are seeking to be true friends of all, we offer our prayers on behalf of the church and on behalf of the world. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing to others, bringing the promise of your kingdom nearer by our words and deeds. On this day, gracious God, we lift these prayers of our community as we seek to bring hope and healing. We ask that you would surround Bob Crumwhitey and his family 
as Bob continues to be hospitalized with pneumonia. Provide them with comfort and wisdom, O oh God, and give wisdom to his care team that they may chart a path forward back to health for Bob. Be present with those in our congregation who are now healing at home. Be present with Barbara Bennett, Ollie Hawks, Verna Porter, Sue Wallach, Carol Healy, Colleen Hasforth, and Keith Hansen as they recover from recent illnesses. And we ask for your presence and love to surround their family and friends also who provide support. We lift our prayers on this day for Lowell Fermanich as he continues in hospice care and for all who love him as they walk this journey together. We lift Sandy Johnson's sister-in-law, Jen, to your loving presence as Jen is hospitalized in the ICU with a rare blood disease. Give Jen the assurance even now of your love and care for her. We remember friends and neighbors of Ali and Marianne Hawkes as they grieve losses, as they recover from illnesses, and for a spouse who is left alone and lonely. On this day, gracious God, we also lift the recovery of Myla Hammond to you. After a recent adenoid surgery, now the family awaits biopsy results. And so may they feel your comfort and presence as they wait. We offer our prayers for Jim Boots as he recovers after a, an accident. An accidental collision with a tree branch can bring much injury and we lift Jim to your loving care. We also lift a friend of Jeff Bell's who is grieving at the loss of a spouse. Surround this friend and all who mourn with your holy presence. We offer our prayers for Lori Cantonen this week. Lori is our district superintendent and Micah's mom. And as Lori faces surgery this week for an aortic aneurysm, may she know your loving presence and surround her family and care team with wisdom and compassion. We carry in our hearts our own Sarah Main as she heals, Sarah's mother in the dying process, and Linda Jeanette receiving cancer treatments. May each of these beloved ones draw on your strength and feel your presence ever near to them. We pray for Ella Davis on this day who continues to recover after a stem cell transplant. And we continue to pray for her beloved family who walk this difficult journey with her. God, we fervently, fervently pray for peace in our communities, in our country, and in the world across the world where there are wars and political unrest. Bring peace and resolution that honors the well-being of all people. And now in the silence of this moment, we lift prayers that are too private to be spoken aloud, prayers that we carry with us in these moments of silence and draw near to each of us. Holy God, we trust all of our lives to you, knowing that you will keep us in your love, inspire us when we need our courage renewed, and carry us through all the good and bad that we face. And now, gracious God, we seal our prayer and we say together the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to our offering time, and Jeff, I'll invite you to just kind of make your way up to share when I'm done here. In this church, offering is such a special time 
because we realize it is our opportunity to partner with God in blessing other people and making the world better. So it is a good thing, and it brings joy and hope, healing and courage to our spirits. If you have financial gifts to give today and you are in person, there are offering plates at the front of the church and, and at the back of the church. You can always bring your gift to the church office. If you're online or prefer to give electronically, you can give through text, you can give online, you can always bring your gifts to the church office. Information is in the, at the end of the bulletin, below the worship video, and in the weekly email. Thank you so much for your constant, consistent, generous giving. It makes everything that happens through this church happen. So thank you for that giving. And now Jeff is going to talk about another way that we are giving, and we are focusing all of April on this. Thank you very much, Janine. Um, I'm here to talk briefly about a major project our church is undertaking to help replace all of our old fluorescent light bulbs in the building with new energy efficient LED bulbs. And we are just beginning, we're doing our fundraising campaign for it. And if you're interested in more information or helping to contribute and join members of the trustees, members of the sustainability committee in doing this, there's an information table as you go out uh, the doors to your right. And I just want to briefly talk about this because this is a really exciting project because in sustainability, we often talk about hitting a sweet spot where what we can do will both be good for our planet and good for us as an organization. And this project to replace all of our old energy and efficient bulbs is one of those. We will, if we manage to do this, we've got over 600 light bulbs to replace. And we're going to hopefully have a team of people who will go through and help prepare the way for that. And one of the things, if you look at it, we will find that we'll cut our electricity bills, which will cut our carbon footprint. We'll be able to, all the old fluorescent bulbs currently have mercury in them. We'll dispose of those properly to take them out of the environment safely. The ballasts may have PCBs in them. Again, they'll be disposed of properly. So our environment is really going to be better for it. But it'll also benefit us financially because as we reduce our electric consumption, so too will our, our power bills go down that we pay to Minnesota Power, which will mean that we'll have more money for the important ministry and mission that the church does. And so I invite you to join with members of sustainability and the trustees to take part in that. You can find out about how to give financially at the information table. You can find out more about the other ways you can contribute. And you can just find out more about the project. It's a really good project where we can have a win-win-win here. And Janine, thank you so much. And Jeff, I have a question for you. It's actually a question of the children. They asked it last Sunday, so you've had a week to think about it. They're wondering if those lights up there count in the 600 and some. No, those, have already, those are already LED lights. And, in, and they can be set to a, apparently a couple of different levels. And we re if we give Alex unlimited power and authority, he can do amazing magic with lighting. Um, so I'm not so sure. So make sure to let to the kids know that everyone here. <laughs> and as we contemplate how we are together, givers with God, let us stand and sing together the doxology. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Then the disciples gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, 
it is not for you to know the times, the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Our second reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. When we know that God's got the whole world in God's hands, we can have courage. Which brings us to our topic for today, courage. We need courage if we are to move through life well. A child needs courage to learn how to crawl and walk and explore their world. A 
A teen and young adult needs courage to figure out who they are, what is important to them, and what they were created to do and be. And that is a scary time in life where lots of courage is needed. Courage is needed to pick a career, a spouse, to become a parent. We need courage to deal with the challenges and setbacks and losses that are a part of life. We need courage as we grow older. Growing older is indeed a privilege, but it sure isn't for the weary. I know some of you know that well. It is hard. It's sometimes painful. It's scary. It takes courage. We need courage to face physical illness and mental illness. We need courage to face eventual death. Courage. Without courage, we won't do all the great things that are here for us to do in this life. Most everything that we are going to do well takes a certain amount of courage. And so developing courage is a very wise thing for us to do in whatever stage of life, in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. And so today we are beginning a new sermon series called Brave Faith, where for six weeks we're going to explore courage. How faith in Jesus creates and informs a courageous life. I'm really excited about this. I've never done a sermon series on courage before. Jesus calls us to a brave faith and shows us the way. Today we're going to do an overview of courage and look at the courage that comes with clarity. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at courage for conviction, Courage for candor, courage for hope, courage for fortitude, and courage for love. And I want you to listen to all these sermons, so remember if you miss one or want to listen back to parts of it, you can go online to YouTube and do that. We're going to see how courage was developed and lived out in the life of Jesus Christ and how we can develop it and live it out too. Let's pray as we begin. God, as we hear your words read and shared, open our ears, help us hear what you need us to hear. Open our minds, give us a glimpse of the divine, and then open our souls, prepare us for the courage that you have in store for us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Courage is a very real and a very important part of following in the footsteps of Jesus. Did you know that courage is referred to in the Bible about a hundred times? Often we are told to take courage. So where are we to find this courage that we are told to take up? Listen to words about courage in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, words that Moses offered the people of Israel before his death and before they had to move on to the promised land without him. He said these words, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. God will never leave you or forsake you. You see, Moses wanted the people to understand that we can have courage, and we especially have courage when we remember that God goes with us, and no matter what, God will never, ever abandon us. When Jesus is warning the disciples about his impending death, and he tells them of the sorrows they are going to experience, he tries to answer their confused questions. He warns them that they will be scattered, that they will abandon him, that they will be leaving him to face his dire circumstances by himself. And then he says this, found in John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles, but take courage. I have overcome the world. What we learn from this scripture 
is that the courage that we are to take up is rooted in what Jesus has already done in the death and resurrection. Courage isn't something we just hope for. Courage is available to us. Courage is a gift from God. Tom Berlin, a United Methodist pastor and author of a book called Courage, Jesus and the Call to Brave Faith, the book which inspired this sermon series, he writes this. Courage is necessary for Christians to fulfill the mandates of their faith and live in ways consistent to the high calling of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is so true. In today's scripture reading from the first chapter of Acts, we find Jesus describing to his friends the mission that's going to define the rest of their lives, a mission that is going to require of them great courage. Jesus had been with them for three years, leading them, teaching them. After his resurrection, he spent 40 days with them. They now know that Jesus really is God, really has overcome death, that all he taught them was true. And now he's about to ascend into heaven, and he gives them important parting words with great clarity. He tells them that they are going to be his witnesses, that they are to share his teachings, his way of life, and the invitation to follow his ways in places familiar to them, and in places they have never been and maybe didn't even at that time know existed. Jesus knows that the message that they will bring is not always going to be welcomed, that like him, his friends are going to experience challenge and hardships, rejection, persecution, and imprisonment. He knows that they are going to need courage to do what he is asking. And in order for them to have the courage, he knows he needs to give them a very clear picture of the task before them. Clarity. You see, when we don't have a sense of clarity about what is before us, it's hard to muster up the courage to take action. But that all changes when we have a picture of what needs to be done, when we have clarity. Clarity motivates us to act. Jesus had great clarity in his life. We see this when John baptizes Jesus. Remember the story? When Jesus comes up out of the water, he hears a voice from heaven saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. So in this message, Jesus receives the clarity of his identity. He belongs to God. And did you know that in our birth and baptism, we have that same clarity of identity? We too belong to God. Then we come to the next scene. Jesus is in the wilderness. Jesus, we read, ate nothing for the 40 days that he was there. We don't know how he survived in the wilderness for those 40 days, but certainly it took courage. We do know that Jesus went there to gain clarity about his next steps, about his life mission. Jesus was tempted three times while in the wilderness, and the temptations he faced are really the same temptations we face today. First, the temptation for self-sufficiency. The evil one told Jesus to turn the stones into bread so that he could eat something and and fill his stomach. But Jesus refused because he knew we are not created for self-sufficiency, but for inter-sufficiency. Second, the temptation of self-aggrandizement. The evil one tried to tempt Jesus with power, wealth, and privilege, but he refused because he knew those aren't the things that matter most. And the third temptation was for self-promotion. The evil one took him to the highest point that he could find and told Jesus to jump, and then if he jumped, certainly the angels would come to him and protect him, and then everyone would know who he was and would worship him. But Jesus refused because he knew his mission was not about self-promotion, and neither is ours. Three times Jesus was tempted Three times Jesus refused. Why? 
because he had clarity. He knew who he was and he knew what he was called to do. And because he had clarity, he was able to walk away from any temptation to be something he was not or do something he wasn't called or created to do. We continue to see evidence of Jesus' clarity in the next scene from Luke's Gospel. Jesus is in Nazareth, his hometown, and he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to read to those gathered, and he began to read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, and then when he finished reading these words that the people had heard over and over again, he spoke words that made it crystal clear about who he was and what his purpose was. Jesus said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Can't you just hear Jesus saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the Lord's favor. And later on, he would tell those disciples that they too would do those things, that that scripture is fulfilled also in them. Because of the clarity Jesus had. He knew who he was. He knew his purpose. Friends, did you know that the same can be true for us today? Let's pause now for a moment. Let's go deeper. Let's get more personal. How about you? Have you been thinking much lately about what your life is about? Each of us is different. We are each in diverse seasons of life with widely varying circumstances. Is it time for us to seek clarity for whatever situation or season of life we are finding ourselves? As we seek clarity as to what we need to be about in this season of life, let's be careful not to judge others. You see, their life situation and experiences, their personality, their makeup, may have their sense of clarity look different from ours. When we begin to have clarity for our own season of life, it will lead us to the courage to face and do what is before us. When you are clear about your role in parenting, you will become a better parent, focusing on what is best for the children, whatever their age, not which makes them happiest or makes life easiest for them or makes you feel best. When I am clear about my values and choices concerning my relationships, I'm able to appreciate them more, live without regrets or resentments, make other people's lives easier and better. When you are clear about what is expected of you as a student or an employee, you will be a better learner and worker. When we are clear about our role with the environment, that will determine how much plastic we choose to use, whether we will be a part of moving to LED bulbs, how we will steward the earth. When I am clear about my values, specifically looking out for the most vulnerable, those who have the least, that will impact how I spend my money and my voting at election time. It will impact so many things. When you have clarity about working toward health and and wholeness, that will give you strength to begin dealing with unhealthy behaviors and addictions and abuse and will help in boundary making. When we are clear about why following the ways of Jesus Christ are crucial, we will become a better church and we will be looking outside of ourselves much more than looking internally. 
And when we truly believe with clarity that God is with us always, then we can face the most dire, scary situations and events with confidence, assurance, and strength. One of the most courageous people I know is Larry. When his wife died in a car accident, he didn't want to go on. The pain was so overwhelming, he didn't think he could stand it. And then he looked at his two little girls, six months old and barely four years old, and he got clarity. He knew his purpose was all about them, about raising them well. And so he promised his wife and he promised God he would do that. That absolute clarity of purpose gave him the courage to keep living even when the pain was unbearable. Gave him the courage to keep coming to church even when his faith was strained. Gave him the courage to make a career change, to make himself more available to the kids. Gave him the courage to put their needs above all else. Folks, isn't it true that in all things we do better when we have clarity? And clarity gives rise to courage. The inverse is also true. If we find that our courage is waning, that's often due to a lack of clarity doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, or what you're striving to accomplish. When you have clarity, you begin to find courage. But you have to know what to be clear about. Here are some things to help you in your quest to find clarity. Take time to reflect on your life. What is happening? Notice how you are feeling. Think about the challenges and blessings surrounding you. And then pray to God and and ask God what you need to be focusing on in this season of life. Take a look at what's happening in your home, in your church, in your school, in your workplace, your city, your nation and world. Pray about what is needed and how you can be a part of meeting the need. When you are seeking clarity, Remember your baptism and your confirmation vows. Remember how you promised to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Remember that you have chosen to follow the ways of Jesus Christ. And remember that together we vowed to nurture and help one another in this quest of seeking clarity and purpose. That's the blessing of community. If you're needing to find some clarity, read one of the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, to help you remember Jesus' life and his teachings, his clarity, his sense of purpose. And as you are reminded of Jesus' purpose and clarity, it is likely that your sense of purpose will become more clear. And finally, remember that Jesus sought a new way of life, A life of peace and love and forgiveness. Jesus didn't choose self-sufficiency. He didn't look for self-aggrandizement. He wasn't about self-promotion. No, Jesus was clear. He had clarity. It was all about peace, forgiveness, love, and community. Friends, Courage is God's gift to ordinary people, people like you and me. And having courage, it makes so much difference for you personally and for us as a community. So let's seek clarity. And then, may the Spirit give us courage to follow. Amen. Let us sing together number 308, Thine Be the Glory. Would you rise as we sing?
be seated. Hasn't this been good? Don't our souls need this time together? Following the post salute, I invite you to head down to the lower level for coffee and donuts. And there's a couple of new families here with kids in the nursery. Make sure to bring your nursery kids to the social hall where they can play and, and have donuts and where you can greet others. And make sure to look around for people new to you. Greet and welcome them both up here and down in the lower social hall. Right outside the doors to your left is the welcome table. Stand go over there and meet Greg and get information about the church. To your right is the LED table for information and the sign-up table for activities. So make sure to stop there. Next Sunday, we're going to continue this series on brave faith, and we're going to look at courage for conviction. But for today, for today, I've got a feeling that there's more than one of you who are needing clarity in some area of your life. Seek that clarity. And then when you begin to find that clarity, have the courage to act on it. It won't be easy, but you will find hope and healing when you do that. And you'll offer it to others. Amen. And go in peace. Thank you.